much. Thank you. Governor Blanco, Lieutenant Governor Landrew, and especially President Cowan for inviting me here tonight. Boy, it's good to be home. <laughs> You know, it's especially good to be home in a time of crisis because tough times force us to return to the fundamentals. And there's nothing more fundamental than home. Now, many of you are visitors to New Orleans, but believe me, it won't take four years for the Crescent City to be forever in your blood. So I feel in a way that we are all home tonight. I also feel a special honor in speaking to you on Martin Luther King Jr.'s day because it was Dr. King's timeless activism that fostered our modern way of relating to one another. Yes, we're here tonight empowered with the feeling that if we want to, we can speak truthfully to one another. If we want to, we can work together. We can rely on one another because Dr. King's actions made his dream our reality. And this rebuilding of New Orleans gives us the perfect opportunity to see if we're ready to extend the legacy of Dr. King and the civil rights movement. Now I want y'all to look around this room. I'd always take the time to look and see where you are and understand the moment that you're in. I want y'all to realize, all you young people, that the final chapter of that movement still waits for a generation with the courage to write it. That's why I say we are all home tonight. We are all home because Dr. King led the charge to victory over regressive, ignorant traditions that had long gone unchallenged. Because... Because he was unwavering in presenting compelling arguments to make real the promises of the Constitution. Because he never succumbed to hopelessness and showed all of us what one citizen can achieve when armed with an evangelical zeal for freedom and a first class education. Yes, it is most fitting to reopen our city's finest institutions of higher education on the day we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yes, it is. Though he is almost always reduced to a dreamer today, let me let you know that Dr. King was an achiever, a most powerful exemplar of action. His last book is entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? It is a question that is most appropriate for us in this moment. You see, there are shadows of chaos all around us. Dr. King worked in the shadow of slavery and discrimination. We are in the shadow of the worst natural disaster to ever befall America. What better way to celebrate him than by rising to a challenge? His challenge was to reverse 80 years of legalized apartheid, a veritable way of life right here in our land of freedom. Our challenge is merely to rebuild a great city in times of unbelievable political callousness and corruption. Even in these times, <laughs> even in these times, there are still neighbors that will turn their backs on neighbors. There are many who are doing unbelievable acts of heroism course. Those are the things that we should celebrate, but let us not, in our zeal to celebrate our rebuilding, lose sight of all the things that go on all the time that remind us so much of the tragedies of our past. Yes, this is Louisiana, and we are home tonight. I want y'all to understand about Dr. King. Through a tireless, single-minded campaign to expose lies and sanctioned injustice, 
Dr. King never lost faith in the ability of humans to behave better. He didn't settle. He succeeded. Now, certainly his single-mindedness is what is required of us at this time to rebuild New Orleans. Don't settle. Succeed. Catch his slogans aside. When we look around here, we see destruction, anguish, and uncertainty. Let's look deeper into ourselves and find possibility. That's why it's important to mark the reopening of New Orleans with the triumphant return of Tulane, Xavier, Loyola, and Dillard universities. Through first-class education, a generation marches down the long, uncertain road of the future with confidence. And after all is said and done, education's purpose is to lead students to who they are, what they can be, and who they want to be. And the best way to be is to do. And when we pass on the best of what we do, that is quality education. You know, if we're lucky, if we're all lucky, we only really have a good 80 years or so on this earth. And through education, those 80 are extended through the generations that follow. Now, I want you all to look around this campus. We can't see it right now, of course. <laughs> Paul Tulane put his life into this campus over 120 years ago. And it's still here, inviting us tonight. I know I spent many a night as a high school student struggling in the Tulane library. It's here for us now. And it's gonna be here for young people looking for knowledge to define themselves and their time long after we're all gone. That's why it's important to address young people in the reopening of New Orleans. You see, you've always been at the forefront of social change. In rebuilding, let's revisit the potential of American democracy and American glory when its citizens are mobilized to enlightened action. The soldiers in Martin Luther King's army were people demanding change. Lawyers, clerks, politicians, housewives, businessmen, maids, clergymen. But the ones on the front lines, well, they were America's. That's it. That's it. You breaking it down. They were America's youth. Young people much like you who felt empowered to better our nation who understood that change required sacrifice, who were emboldened with a spirit of rightness and were determined to create change for the betterment of our country. That is why, as I stand before you tonight, I say the best way to be is to do. Don't settle for style. Succeed in substance. President Cowan has said, don't you come back here if helping restore New Orleans is not in your DNA. And 91% of you Tulane students have returned. Most of you, most of you have returned at a time when many would have stayed away. And now that you are here, you have the opportunity to set a new tone. Not only a new tone for New Orleans, but believe it or not, a new tone for our nation. And if you are vocal enough and intelligent enough, a new tone for the entire world. Don't doubt yourself. Remember, only 56 men signed the Declaration of Independence, of which Ben Franklin said, we must all hang together, or assuredly, we shall all hang separately. <laughs> now, a few hanging together can lead a nation to change. You know, we love to patronize young people with slogans like, the young will lead the way. <laughs> Actually, the young very seldom lead anything. <laughs> it's been quite some time since a younger generation pushed an older one to a higher standard. Think about that. It's been quite some time. You know, my daddy thought, no, actually he expected that my brothers and I and our generation would make the world a better place. He was 26 years old before he could ride on the front of a streetcar. He was correct in his belief. 
that things would be better for us and that we could make things better. Because he had lived in an America of continual social progress. Depression followed prosperity. Segregation was followed by integration, and so on. And though I haven't quite pinpointed it yet, somewhere between my daddy's youth and mine, generational aspirations for a richer democracy changed to aspirations for a richer me. More wealth and more leisure time for a lower quality of work. Oh, yes. <laughs> and forget about our political process. Voting became too much of a bore let alone keeping an eye on how our tax dollars were being squandered or how our interests were being poorly served by elected officials. When did we begin to lose faith in our ability to affect change? Perhaps the demoralizing murders of John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King. Maybe they scared the civic-minded young people of the 1960s right out of their idealism into despair and then to indifference. Perhaps it was the 1980s when the opportunity inherent in the American dream was distorted from the land of we to the land of to hell with anybody else but me. Maybe the preoccupation with technological progress has overshadowed our concern with human progress. In any case, the result of this social inactivity is that generations are now simply named for the last letters of the alphabet. <laughs> and these alphabet named people are distinguished by the ability to manipulate new technology, buy new things with money they have not earned, and be obsessed with the trivial lives of celebrities. <laughs> tendency to make generations unanimous, but in fact, there really have only ever been a few people in each generation who step out, who are willing to put themselves on the line and risk everything for their beliefs. Only a few act. The rest of us reap the benefits of their risk. You know, I always laugh when people my age complain about their college age and teenage kids by talking about how much better we were. <laughs> Man. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I laugh because I have absolutely no idea what my generation did to enrich democracy. What movement have we been identified with that forced elders to keep their promises, that challenged their failures or built upon their successes? For me, we dropped the ball after the civil rights movement. Right on, President. We entered a period of complacency and closed our eyes to the very public corruption of our democracy. We've seen our money squandered and stolen, our civic rights trampled, and the politics of polarity become the order of the day. We have held absolutely no one accountable. From us, you all inherit an abiding helplessness. <laughs> If you realize the unfortunate consequences of inaction, hopefully you will understand even more the importance of holding both your elders and your peers accountable when it comes to the rebuilding of New Orleans. Stay up on the facts. What? other than injustice, could be the reason that the displaced citizens of New Orleans cannot be accommodated by the richest nation in the world. You, along with the entire world, saw the bureaucratic fumbling and lack of concern inflicted on those very same citizens at the Superdome and the Convention Center. Who is being held accountable now? Take your example not from my generation, but from generations, from those few inspired young people who stood on the front lines and fought injustice throughout the course of our nation's history. For example, in the first 20 years 
of the 1900s, youth supported the progressive movement to keep farmers from being shafted by big business, as well as movements for women's suffrage, workers' rights, the establishment of a League of Nations, and of course, keeping alcohol legal. <laughs> the next 20 years would see the repeal of prohibition and young people pushing for the establishment of social security and unemployment insurance. Young people vowed to fight fascism with the Lincoln Brigades and also vowed not to fight old folks' wars by taking the Oxford Oath. The 1940s began with young people fighting the good war. The 50s saw young folks involved in tearing down the laws that supported segregation, challenging parental taste and authority with rock and roll, and questioning conformity with the beatniks. Man, I like you. I'm going to have to hire you. <laughs> I didn't know you was going to be here. You know, I didn't, I didn't know you was going to be here tonight. You should have brought some of your friends with you. We can have a service up in here. The 60s, that's right. What's wrong with that? The 60s and 70s saw youth challenging Vietnam, the role of women, rituals of courtship, race relations, and the political process itself. Today, we still reap the benefits of these generations' successes and suffer the losses of their failures. The rebuilding of New Orleans is an important point in the history of the United States. I don't want you to think it's not important because you're here. I, you know, okay, language, man, language. I don't want you to get too modern on us. Language. Should my generation expect yours to be the watchdogs of this effort? Should we expect you to monitor how our leaders handle the responsibility to restore our city? Well, my generation might not, because we haven't been very good watchdogs ourselves. But I do. Believe me, I expect y'all to be different than the example we've set for you. Don't you wait for somebody else to do later what you can do now. When you perceive a problem, instead of speaking about it in dorm rooms or in hushed corners of bars or even loudly in bars, <laughs> put together a group of friends and be very loud and public in your dissent. When you notice inconsistencies between what is said by government officials and what is done, exercise your individual and collective power to take steps to remove them. Our form of democracy allows you to do that. Remember, the best way to be is to do. In the opening days of this new year, the president reiterated that the levies will be fixed. Yes, money has been appropriated, but is it enough? The task has been assigned. People have been put in charge, but are they going to take care of it? Are they waiting for people like you to stop paying attention? At least ask to go back to the days of honest graph. <laughs> you know how Boss Tweed and them would do in New York? They would build stuff and overcharge you for it. But when they got finished charging you, you had something. <laughs> now we tear stuff down and you don't have nothing. <laughs> now is the time for your generation to reclaim the energy, optimism, and fire that is the real American spirit. I'm confident that you students can and will make an incalculable contribution to the intelligent and compassionate rebuilding of our city and protection of our dispersed populace. In doing so, you will be using your collective power to redefine the soul of our nation, to redefine the meaning of being an American. You know, democracy is a can-do form. We always hear about the rights of democracy. But the major responsibility of it is participation. Throughout American history, we have seen causes for the betterment of our democracy invigorated by young people unafraid to fight for the general welfare of all people, even if it meant, at times, and very seriously, alienation from their own families. Don't you be disheartened by the destruction of the hurricane 
or by political ineptitude, or even by apathy in others, remember, we are all home. And what is more dysfunctional than being home? <laughs> And that's why I urge you, do not let this moment pass without sending a clear message to your peers and elders around the world. New Orleans will be rebuilt, and it will be rebuilt with an intensity, with an intelligence, with an impatience, and with a freshness that only serious-minded young people can bring. One of the great lessons of the Civil Rights Movement, when the minds and hearts of enough citizens are focused on change, America changes very quickly. I once asked my father, man, did you know in 1953 that you were going to not be riding on the back of a bus? In 1967, he said, no way in the world, man. No way in the world. Now, I know that the challenge of rebuilding may seem insurmountable, but we do have a roadmap to success. The path of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Because he didn't settle for, that's just the way things are. We don't have to. Because he led an intelligent assault on all sorts of sanctioned corruption, we too can use our intelligence to protect and project integrity. Almost a foreign word in this time. Because he understood that all human beings are of one race long before the discovery of the DNA strain, we can now live that same reality because Dr. King walked with thunder because Dr. King would not be turned around because Dr. King was willing to ultimately pay the price of his life for us to not be chained to our legacy of, of slavery and ignorance because it wasn't that long ago. Because Dr. King stood on the front lines. Because he faced apathy from his own people. All sorts of Americans. Because the civil rights movement was not a black movement, but an American movement. Our history compels us to act definitively. Because we do not come from cowards, and we are not cowardly. Because Dr. King was always about the business of making real the human grandeur outlined in the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights, he let us know that it wasn't a joke or something to be taken lightly because he made those central documents real. We can still believe that our government can be of the people, by the people, and for the people. We need to concentrate our energies to that end. Now you will hear that the most immediate concerns for New Orleans are the wetlands, the levees, and the houses. But I'm here to tell you right here tonight that the most immediate concern for New Orleans is the well-being of our displaced neighbors spread out in a diaspora all over the United States of America. understand we come from a common experience we come from a common experience I've traveled the world and one thing I learned around the world I am an American believe me this is something that I know to be true and understand I want y'all to look around this room and I want you to understand that there are forces all around you who wish to exploit divisions to rob you of your freedom and tell you what to think. They are afraid of change. And some of these forces are even within you. But I'm here to tell you tonight, when young folks are motivated to action and when they act with insight, soul, and fire, they can rekindle the weary spirit of a slumbering nation. It's time somebody woke us up. <laughs> 